Hi, I'm Scott with B&H and this is the new 16-inch MacBook Pro with an M3 Max chip. We're three years and three generations of chips into Apple's foray into making their own ARM-based silicon, and I have to say that Apple continues to do a good job of iterating on their innovative M line of CPUs. Now, this is a channel aimed at photo video professionals and enthusiasts, and this is the high-end Max version of the chip. So I'm going to go ahead and focus on the video post-production performance of the machine and go over the benchmarking test that I ran on it. That said, let's go ahead and run through some of the official specs and features first. The 16-inch MacBook Pro M3 Max comes in two main configurations, one with a 14-core CPU, 30-core GPU, and either 36 or 96 gigabytes of unified memory. The second one, which is the one that I have with me, has a 16-core CPU, 40-core GPU, and 48, 64, or 128 gigabyte options for the unified memory. The 14-core version has 300 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, while the 16-core version is capable of up to 400 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Both also have a 16-core neural engine for AI or machine learning processes. As far as ports and displays go, not much has changed from this machine's M1 and M2 predecessors. They each have Liquid Retina XDR displays, three Thunderbolt 4 ports, an HDMI port, an SDXC card slot, a 3.5mm headphone jack, and of course, the MagSafe 3 power port. One option that seems small, but I keep hearing a surprising amount of hype for, is that the M3 models come in a space black color instead of space gray. It does look slick, and I appreciate the change up in the standard color options, even if it is a slight change. Personally though, I'm still holding out hope that Apple will someday revisit their colorful aesthetics from the late 90s and early aughts. Okay, let's dive into the real stuff. Apple Silicon really is its own beast. No one is making chips quite like these, and it's easy to forget that it's only been three years since Apple moved away from the Intel CPUs. This is still relatively new technology that's ripe for innovation as the engineers over at Apple become more familiar and comfortable with the architectural paradigm. That's why I pulled out an M1 Max MacBook Pro and an M2 Max MacBook Pro for comparison. First off, it won't surprise you to learn that the M3 chips still have hardware-accelerated encode and decode for AVC, HEVC, and the various flavors of ProRes codecs. This is probably the biggest selling point for the M line of chips when it comes to video work. The M3s have added AV1 decoding into the mix, which isn't really relevant for video work, but it should improve performance for streaming video content. Speaking of cores, the M3 Max has increased its other core counts compared to its predecessors. The M1 Max has eight performance cores and two efficiency cores, the M2 Max added two efficiency cores for a total of four, and the M3 Max added four more performance cores on top of that for a total of 12 performance cores and four efficiency cores. The number of GPU cores has also been steadily increasing over the years, starting with the 32-core GPU in the M1 Max, the 38-core GPU in the M2 Max, and now the 40-core GPU in the M3 Max. These may seem like incremental increases, but that's why we have to look beyond just the number of cores. In a lot of ways, the M2 chip was a more polished version of the M1, while the M3 is more of a new iteration on the core concept. There have been some significant re-engineering of both the physical build of the chip as well as the architecture it operates on. On the physical level, the M3 is touting new 3 nanometer nodes, which is a big improvement over the 5 nanometer nodes in the M1 and M2. The smaller nodes lead to a better transistor density, which should increase the efficiency and performance of the chips without a proportional increase in power consumption. So you can expect these new MacBooks to maintain their relatively impressive battery life and heat management. And while 3 nanometers and 5 nanometers might not sound like a big difference, it starts to look a whole lot more impressive when it's instead put in terms of how many transistors each chip has. The M1 Max has 57 billion transistors, the M2 Max has 67 billion transistors, and the M3 Max is coming in at a whopping 92 billion transistors. The physical transistor density isn't the only improvement to efficiency, though. Turning to the architecture of the chips, there are some exciting additions. Apple says that they did a lot of work revisiting and re-engineering the way the GPU is integrated into the workflow of the chip. First off, Apple has decided to make their platform a more competitive option for gaming, adding in hardware-accelerated ray tracing and mesh shading. Those features will also benefit other work involving 3D modeling and simulations. But the more exciting change to the GPU architecture is the dynamic caching feature. Dynamic caching allows the M3 chips to more precisely allocate exactly as much memory as needed for any given task. 
that's a potentially huge boon for a unified memory platform like Apple Silicon. But how does all of that hold up in practice? I have numbers. I ran some exports using Premiere, Resolve, After Effects, and Handbrake. For the NLEs, Premiere and Resolve, I made four 15-minute sequences using ProRes 422HQ, RED, RE RAW, and AVC footage directly from our C70 cameras. For the export settings, I used our team's web delivery presets, which is UHD, HEVC encode, targeting 35 megabits per second. While each sequence uses different codecs, they have identical graphics, effects, cuts, speed changes, sizing transforms, etc. There are multicams, compositing interpretations, and layers on layers on layers. I tried to simulate as many common elements in an edit as I could to make these tests comprehensive. These sequences would be a true nightmare for any assistant editor tasked with the online prep and conform. Just truly sloppy and nonsensical, which is perfect for putting a machine through its paces. Okay, starting with Premiere slash Media Encoder. The M3 Max ProRes 422HQ export time comes in at 8 minutes and 18 seconds for our 15 minute sequence. That's just a 2.9% improvement compared to the M2 Max and a 5.3% improvement compared to the M1 Max. With the AVC sequence, the M3 Max exported the sequence in 9 minutes 20 seconds, which is a 9.8% improvement in render time compared to the M2 Max and a 17% improvement compared to the M1 Max. Keep in mind that AVC and ProRes both have hardware acceleration on Apple Silicon, but we also tested some beefier professional codecs as well that don't have that luxury. We see much more significant gains here, which I think really speaks to the increase in raw power for these new chips. With the red footage, the M3 Max export took 7 minutes and 18 seconds, which is an 8.6% improvement over the M2 Max, and a 14.6% improvement from the M1 Max. Finally, the RA RAW sequence rendered in 7 minutes and 52 seconds, or a 16.7% improvement next to the M2 Max, and an impressive 23.1% improvement from the M1 Max. Okay, moving on to Resolve. Now, I'm primarily a Premiere editor, but I do have to say that Resolve really knows how to make the most of a computer's resources. The M3 Max exported the ProRes sequence in 2 minutes 39 seconds. That's a 30.3% improvement from the M2 Max and a 34.5% difference compared to the M1 Max. The AVC export times came in at 2 minutes 32 seconds, which is 6.7% better than the M2 Max and 35.6% better than the M1 Max. The M3 Max RED render timed in at 3 minutes 46 seconds, which is a 23.1% improvement from the M2 Max and a 38.7% improvement from the M1 Max. Lastly, the RA RAW M3 Max export took 5 minutes 26 seconds, which is a 16.2% improvement compared to the M2 Max and a 33.7% improvement from the M1 Max. For the graphics work, I had a 2 minute After Effects sequence with chroma keys, color grades, and particle effects. The M3 Max exported it in 3 minutes 2 seconds, which was over a minute faster than the two previous models. That's a 26.9% improvement over the M2 Max, and a 32% difference compared to the M1 Max. It's clear that the M3 Max is, as expected, an improvement over its predecessors, but is the jump from Gen 2 to Gen 3 as significant as the jump from Gen 1 to Gen 2? Yes, and in some cases more so. Some of these numbers only show an incremental improvement. The AVC Pro Res and RED exports from Premiere and the RED and RA RAW exports out of Resolve all had comparable performance boosts between the generations. But on the other hand, with this new generation, Media Encoder shows significantly better improvement in its handling of RA RAW, and Resolve's handling of ProRes shows much better performance boosts compared to the previous generational transition. Similarly, After Effects shows much better gains between the M3 and M2 than it did between the M2 and the M1. These sorts of improvements show just how much work Apple has been putting into their silicon. But as discussed before, a lot of these examples take advantage of Apple's hardware accelerated encode and decode support. What if we take those out of the equation? Is there an improvement in processes that rely solely on the CPU? Now, the last set of tests I ran were using Handbrake software only encode. I took a 15 minute video in the DNX HRLB codec, and I ran it through Handbrake software only encode using the same UHD 35 megabits per second HEV settings as before. These took longer, but the results were interesting enough to be worth it. The M1 Max rendered the output file in 37 minutes and 2 seconds. The M2 Max rendered the same file in 29 minutes and 56 seconds, 
while finally the M3 Max was able to do the exact same process in only 19 minutes and 15 seconds, which is a 35.7% improvement over the M2 Max and a 48% improvement compared to the M1 Max. Before we wrap up, there's one more observation I had while I ran these tests. The M3 Max consistently used a lower percentage of its CPU cores despite its faster render times. That's great for power consumption and battery life, but looking closer, it's also clear that the M3 Max spreads the workload more evenly across its cores. I assume this probably has something to do with the dynamic caching. For example, let's look at how Media Encoder uses the CPU resources to export the RA RAW and RED footage across the generations. This is the same program decoding two codecs that are not hardware accelerated. The RA RAW render was one of the exports that showed the most change between the M2 and M3 generations compared to the M1 and M2 generations, while the improvement for the RED render was more incremental. It isn't surprising to see that the M3 Max spreads the processing more evenly across the cores for the much improved RA RAW export. However, we also see that despite showing smaller, more incremental improvements between the hardware generations, the M3 Max export for the RED footage also spreads the processing load more evenly across the CPU cores. If Apple is still finding ways to improve on this trend, it could mean big things for future generations of this tech. We're now three years into Apple's experiment with this new way of designing CPUs, and personally, I continue to be impressed. It's exciting to see laptop and desktop CPUs break into new paradigms for the first time in a while, and I had a lot of fun getting to test them out firsthand. But what do you think? Do you have an M1 or M2 that you're looking to upgrade from? Are you enamored with the space black color and plan on getting a new M3 MacBook just for the aesthetic? Or if you've already been considering moving to Apple Silicon for the first time, do you think this will be your entry point? Let us know in the comments. I'm Scott with B&H. Keep it fun out there, y'all.